I'm Charlie Stenholm. I represented the 17th District of Texas for 26 years. I served on the Agriculture Committee the entire 26 years. I grew up on a farm. I uh, was going to be a vocational agriculture teacher. At least that's when I graduated from Texas Tech and moved home to farm with my dad. Uh, I was going to be an ag teacher, which I did for three and a half years. And then a group of farmers, again, from the Rural Electric Cooperative convinced me to change vocations and manage the Rural Electric Cooperative. And the next step, I'm running for Congress, and there again, my district is rural, my interests are agriculture, and therefore I thought someone that maybe had a basic background and understanding of agriculture would have something to offer to the United States Congress and the Ag Committee, and I had a good run, 13 terms. I teach a class at Tarleton on agricultural policy and energy policy on Monday nights, and just came up, the subject came up, and I showed the tractor cade that the farmers were in dire straits when I was running. The economic situation was really bad for farmers, particularly those that had borrowed too much. And uh, they, uh, my approach in the campaign, I didn't get the support of the American agricultural movement. They supported another candidate in the primary, but they supported me in the general election, which I appreciated. And my concern with their solution, they didn't have one. Uh, it was low prices, we all knew, but how do you make it better and how do you do it in the world? And they didn't have a policy to advocate at first, but they soon got there. And that's the way I try to teach it today is understanding you can have the greatest idea since sliced bread, as we say. You can be 100% right, but unless you can convince 217 of your colleagues that your solution is good, and then 61 senators, and then a president, pardon the grammar, but it ain't gonna happen. So I learned, and I learned real quickly, Republicans were not my enemy, uh, except during elections. Then it was we were opponents, not enemies. But afterwards, uh, I looked for anybody that would agree with me, and I looked for others to agree with. Well, I wish more of our political leaders today would think back and look at, at what I just said, because what I hear now, and this is my first time back to D.C. as we're interviewing today, uh, I haven't been back in about five or six years, and I don't plan to come back anytime soon because lobbying, which I like to do, it's educating, Nobody wants to listen today. Everybody's got their solution to, to what is needed. And to the best of my knowledge and what I hear told me by so many of my friends that are still serving here, few that are still serving here, uh, they're not happy with the situation, but we don't have a solution as yet. One of my favorite memories applies to the previous question you asked me because when you know, as today, the, the entire staff of the Ag Committee is looking at trying to put together a budget resolution to get the Congress into next year and to avoid some big calamities. And we, we had those. And, and I remember one year we had some particular problems between my friends on the other side of the aisle wanting to cut food stamps big time, much more than my side of the aisle wanted. And Larry Combest was the chairman, Republican from Lubbock, Texas, and uh, he and I were good friends, uh, made still good friends. Uh, but uh, he finally came to me and handed me a sheet of paper and said, Charlie, here's the number to go in the budget. And I looked at it and I said, oh, that's gonna be tough sell on my side, but I'll try. So I called Eva Clayton, who was the Congresswoman from uh, North Carolina, was the uh, ranking member of the nutrition committee. So I called Eva, I actually went to Eva's office and I said, Eva, uh, this is the number. And she says, Charlie, I can't do that. And I said, Eva, this is the number. It's either this or nothing. She said, I'll try. The next morning she came to my office, said, you got a deal. There was enough trust on both sides to know, hey, it was a legitimate compromise that brought it together. And that, uh, you know, that made Larry feel good. He caught heck from his side. 
I caught heck from my side, but so be it. I mean, everybody's never going to agree on anything. We're always going to have divisions, but the legislative process demands compromise. And if it doesn't come, we have the chaos that we've got now. Well, one of the areas that we got through the House was passing the balanced budget constitutional amendment. And uh, I knew it wasn't perfect, but if it had passed the Senate, we would have, have a, we'd have, we wouldn't have almost $30 trillion debt today. But to passing it in the House, bipartisanly uh, in the House, and then standing on the back of the Senate floor watching it go down by one vote. And interestingly, Senator Joe Biden voted for it, now President Biden. But uh, so that was one of the, the things that I, I'm not supposed to be proud, but I was, I was happy and glad to see it pass the House, but sad to see it not become law. Now, I will tell you another little quick story to show the differences between now and then and when we see the, the, the House, the Senate so narrow, I mean 50-50 demands that one senator can uh, keep things from happening. We had a situation in the 2002 Farm Bill in which the Senate, uh, Senator Harkin, who was chairman of the Ag Committee, had a different view of what the conservation program was than the House had had. And he was not all wrong in what he wanted. It's just that we, you have to get a compromise and we had signed off in the House on that compromise. And we were holding a hearing, uh, the, uh, the uh, conference with the Senate, and we'd been going for about two weeks, and one man was basically holding it up. And one day we were back over at the Senate, and Larry Combes sitting right next to me, our staffs behind us, senators in front of us. Larry leans over and whispers to me, Charlie, if I get up and walk out, will you follow me? I said, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. So Larry stands up, basically shuts the books and said, as far as I'm concerned, this conference is over. There will be no farm bill until next year because we're at an, an immovable place in the time. And as we're walking back through the tunnel, Larry says, I hope to heck this works. And I said, me too. Well, within a few minutes after I get back to my office, I hear Senate, a couple of senators out in my office. What do you got to do? I said, we know what we got to do. I mean, we, we've got to get a compromise. And Chairman Tom, Next morning, they called the conference back together. Uh, the majority leader of the Senate, Tom Daschle, was in the speaker's chair with the gavel and the uh, chairman's chair, sitting next to Chairman Harkin. Gaveled the meeting together, brought up the vote on the, on the uh, conference title of the, of the uh, conservation credit, passed, handed the gavel back to Mr. Harkin, and it got done. That's, that's where both sides, again, uh, we're willing to work together, and Tom Harkin, I served with him in the House, and that, he, no, no ill feelings, and he understood. He did his best to get what he wanted, but you have to get a compromise. Well, the only thing in life you have to do is die. Everything else is optional, and in the case of farm bills, you've got to find compromises between those who eat and those who produce it. You never get everything that you want and uh, that's I guess so I don't know who said it now but I've been repeating him or her uh, today uh, when he said if if Democrats would start working as hard to preserve our republic as Republicans are doing to tear it down this country would be much better and that's kind of partisan uh, in, in that statement but it's so true and you could say the so same about both on different issues. And one of the things that's missing today that I had when I first came here as a freshman, we had committees that met. The term was regular order, in which when you have an idea, you don't bring it to the speaker and say, Mr. Speaker, this is my idea, and put it out there. You go to the committee, the subcommittee, and the subcommittee takes it up. And you, you then hopefully, in my case, if I had an idea, I went to a Republican. They were my friends. We were working together. And so we'd say, okay, we got two of us. And then you'd go to four and then to eight, 16, and 32. And that's the way the system works. Uh, but you'd have it in subcommittee and you'd find out, lo and behold, not everybody agreed with what the subcommittee did. So then you go to full committee and then you've got all the lobbyists, good 
educators would come in with something we missed and we would go through that. We'd have amendments and you'd improve the bill and then it would go from the house to the house floor. Again, everybody then, all 435 members had their chance to amend it. Then it goes to the Senate, you go through that and then go back to the conference. That's what is missing today. That's what I enjoyed about that. Now, do I look back? Yeah, I've told my class, uh, one of my mistakes was not uh, increasing the minimum wage as we have increased social security because Minimum wage today at $7.25 is ridiculous, and $10, $15 an hour is pretty tough to live on today. And so I wished, in hindsight, that uh, I had uh, discussed with my small business community and my farmers who opposed increasing it for very good reasons. We can't pay it. We, we farmers in particular, could not pay more. They were going broke anyway. And so I wished. I wished I had worked harder in a compromise because the country would be better off today if I had been a that part of that. Another area that I really regret, I, I wished I had uh, paid a little more attention and done a little bit more in trying to be supportive of John Lewis and some of the things that he tried to do uh, in the House. Uh, the racial divide that we've got today is is just a handful of people that are that are doing it, and it's it's tearing our country up, and it shouldn't. And I, I wish that I had uh, found ways to be a little more helpful to get us to where I think we're going to be very soon now, because the overwhelming majority of the American people are not racial; they are not. Uh, they don't have by some do. There are some that are very biased, very racial, and they're racist in their. Uh, their I wished I had uh, taken a little more time on the Ag Committee in dealing with some of the discrimination that, ha was ha that happened many years ago, some of which I was there and didn't do enough hindsight to be of help to it. Well, the special I remember is the portraits that you see around here because I, uh, I, when I look around the Ag Committee and I see Pat Roberts and Mr. Lucas and Goods a good lad, Colin Peterson at the other end. Uh, I served with them uh, and the rep three Republicans. Uh, we worked together. Uh, my fellow Texan here, I never served with him. He came after I, uh, I left the committee. But uh, whatever it was that caused both sides on the ag communities to work together, I won't say it's non-existent today, but it's pretty close from what those who are here tell me. Uh, the anger between staffs. You don't, again, you, you, our, our republic cannot be held together uh, except by compromise. And even the Ag Committee now, you look at the last bills that come out, I can't imagine having the chairman come out with a news release and the ranking member having a different news release. Never happened when I was in the Congress. And they say, okay, Charlie, you're old and you know, you gotta quit worrying about the past. And I said, well, it worked, I think, pretty good for us. And the agriculture community, as I remind my students, said, last check I saw roughly, we've got a little less than 2 million farmers left in the United States, About uh, 170,000 produce 70% of everything it's produced. 170,000 and their organizations that represent them, which are very important, pretty small minority in a, out of 230 million people. And that's one of the things I learned early on. I, was, I couldn't pass any farm bill, any legislation for rural America unless I got some city folks to, to agree. And then I had to listen to what they needed too and put it together. Oh, there, yeah, and that there, it has changed big time. And it's, people are correct when they say, Charlie, you're still living in the past. I said, well, I, yeah, but I teach in the present and the future. And when, when you look at the challenges of the world now and world hunger and how it, they're going to be fed, and then you look at this horrific 
environmental climate change issue and what it means to rural America. Uh, and I have been for the last 10 or 15 years now and, and recognizing that there's a problem and fossil fuels are a problem and that's my district. Uh, you're not gonna eliminate them. Uh, we're about to see very right now what happens when you get a short supply of energy, the price goes up. Just like agriculture is more market oriented today. And so as we look at today's challenges, agriculture and energy, I lobbied for about uh, six or eight years on behalf of big oil, little oil, and Texas oil. I represented them for 23 years, for 26 uh, years, because I kind of believe fossil fuels, oil and gas are important to what's made America the great country we are. And you're not gonna eliminate them anytime soon. And where we got into the, the fight between ethanol and oil and gas, that was a mistake. You can't produce oil and gas without food and fiber and farmers and ranchers. You can't produce farms, food, without the oil and gas industry. And all 330 million Americans need both of us. And so that issue, agriculture allowed to divide us and it shouldn't. The good news is it's coming back together because even in today's political climate, the people, you know, we, we forget, we all forget that under our constitutional form of government, the people ultimately control. We elect our representatives. It's a Republican form of government, a Republic form of government. Uh, often reminded of the words of Ben Franklin when he said, answered the lady when she asked him after he walked out of Constitution Hall, when he was, had just signed the, his name to the Constitution. He said, what have you wrought upon us, Dr. Franklin? And he said, a Republic, if you can keep it. And that is so true today. And that means, again, getting back to elections, make them partisan. But the day after the elections, go back to work like this committee used to work. And it will again someday work that way. It will take leadership and the people will find it eventually. Well, farm prices uh, were ex because you can't stay in business without making a profit. It's the capitalistic form of government, uh, some uh, form of the economy. And so ag prices, uh, dairy was big in my district, uh, and the, the controversy that went with various policies, subsidies. Uh, you know, I remember one of the worst chewing outs I got from a friend after I cast one of the deciding votes on NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Again, we had done the best we could good. I thought it was not a bad piece of legislation, but one of my friends in the cotton business called me and chewed me up one side and down the other uh, in this endeavor until I got a chance to, and then he simmered down and turned out that uh, wasn't as good as it could have been, but it wasn't near as bad as he thought it was gonna be. And trade issues, I, I traveled quite a bit with the Ag Committee uh, and recognize that if, if we're gonna produce and sell at a profit in the United States, our market is not in the United States. It's the world. I mean, we have 330 million of people. The world has eight billion and going to nine billion. So the market for anything you produce is the world and therefore you had better pay attention to the policies. And I, you know, I realized early on, we got a lot of criticism for subsidizing farmers. I, my mother-in-law uh, was in the dress business in Dumas, Texas. And she asked me one day, you know, why, are you, why do you subsidize farmers? I'm not subsidized, I've got to compete with the big stores in Amarillo, Texas. I've got to compete. Why are you subsidizing them? And I, best I could do is say because the rest of the world is subsidizing agriculture and therefore we have to do that to maintain a level playing field. Well, that worked until we got the level playing field and now some people still want to be subsidized. Uh, and I'm not sure that that dog will hunt uh, any, anymore, but trade issues, extremely important. Back then, now, 
we're making some good progress on it. Of course, national defense, I represented uh, Dias Air Base, the home of the first B-1B bomber, and uh, realized how important that was to preserving our ability to, our freedom to govern as we do under our constitution. So I spent, I wasn't, I was only on the Armed Services Committee for, for a brief time in my last, last term, but uh, I was one of those that was constantly looking at those who deal with it to pick out the issues that we needed to be supportive of. And my rural roots and my constituents were very strongly in favor of defending this country. You know, I, I like to start with the, the nutrition side after price. I mean, the, having a, a climate in which producers can work together to achieve a price in the marketplace so that they can stay in business. Uh, that, that was number one of me, and it, easier said than done in our system. But uh, we, the, the next was the constant battle on nutrition. You know, school lunchroom programs, extremely important. Uh, and if, as I ask many a town hall meeting where I'd have my farmers and businesses and others, I'd say, if you and your spouse both working 40 hours a week at minimum wage or a little above it, could you feed your family, clothe your family, house your family, educate your family, buy insurance at the market rate for a family of four unsubsidized by somebody? They usually, at one time, there usually was one that would say, by dang, I did it when I grew up. Nobody helped me. I had to do it on my own. I said, fine, that's not what I asked. Could you do it today? And they said, no, nobody can. And that was one of the discussions that I paid a lot of attention to uh, on the nutrition side. I never served on the committee, except I was on the ranking member of all the committees. But I listened. Eva Clayton's story, uh, she educated me a lot, and, and we got some things right. We got some things very right on that. Uh, it can be improved on today. I've uh, been sharing a few thoughts with some of the members today. Uh, on the uh, nutrition committee now, there's a way to make the nutrition programs work a whole lot better, feeding more people with less money than we're doing today. There's ways to do it, and there are people that are educating and lobbying on that today, and I say just pay attention to them in that endeavor. Conservation and water, I, I come to real quickly because water issues uh, for West Texas <laughs> pretty important. And uh, boy, have the, as the irrigation industry in West Texas and all over the country has uh, gotten more efficient in recognizing that you better take care of that because you can't grow anything without it. And you had better take a look at the, what's happening. And so the conservation programs, I mentioned Tom Harkin had a little different view, but a lot of what he wanted to do has gotten done. It just took us a while to get there. And a lot more is yet to be done. And now, as I remind my students uh, on Monday nights, can you believe Lake Mead going dry and what that will mean to four or five states next year if we don't get an abnormal snowfall or if we should have another year of drought, we are going to have serious water problems Arizona farmers are already being cut off from irrigation water. They understand it's putting them out of business. I've, I've watched a lot of YouTube interviews as I get ready for my classes uh, to talk about it. It's real and you, you can't do anything about it. But uh, water, energy, still some pretty important issues for Congress to get right and administration. Yeah, find a friend on the other side of the aisle and start working on this national attitude that we've got now in which the enemy is the other side. Find a friend. I made so many good friends on both sides of the aisle. And that's the only way you can, you can legislate. Uh, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to, you can have whatever you want done. You've got to find somebody to agree with you. And two of the four the 8 to 16 to 32 to 64, 128, bingo, you're at 218. And that's my advice. And we have those in our political 
lives today, both sides of the aisle, that do their best job on talk radio and on the television shows dividing us and talking about the things that divide them instead of talking about the things that bring them together. And it is so important that we spend a little more time on what brings us together. And that would be my advice certainly to the Ag Committee because you are the last, you were and are the last bastion of that kind of agreement that I saw. And I couldn't believe, cannot believe what has happened today in that community. And again, we the people, we get the government that we vote for. So uh, as people say, Charlie, you, uh, okay, Charlie, you, you keep talking about all the problems. If there's one thing, one, one thing that kind of what you're asking me now, one thing that uh, you, what you do that would, is there one thing you could do to solve the problem? I said, yeah, there is one thing. And that's stop the way we gerrymander congressional districts. When you gerrymander in order to protect the party who happens to be in the majority, like Texas right now, Republicans, when you gerrymander to make safer districts, and in New York, we're Democrats, you gerrymander to make separate districts, and in Illinois, and in Oregon, and a few other states where you continue to gerrymander to protect the incumbent, you're going to get the kind of government we got now, because the only way a Democrat in Texas can be defeated is in a primary, because you've got a safe district. Same way is true with the Republicans. So guess what? The folks on the left that have the most power are the ones that are in that 15 to 20 to 30 percent. And then you get to November and you get elected, and all of a sudden you find out, ooh, if I do that, I'm going to get primaried out next year. I mean, it just, that's the way it works. So, and that. We're going to have to wait another 10 years on that because the states are already doing it. Uh, it's caused me to change my mind on another issue. I was very opposed to term limits, but not anymore. I, I really think a constitutional amendment now to limit the amount of terms that you, how long you can stay here uh, would make good sense. And it's so uplifting when, when I'm around the young men and women and the blue and the gold and see the enthusiasm of our future leaders. It's why I have enjoyed teaching as much as I have and why I'm really, this is my last semester to do it. There comes a time, you know, when, you know, I've spent most of my life leading and following and never gotten out of the way, but I'm now, it's, I'm at the age and we're, it's time to get out of the way. And uh, that's tough, but there comes that time. So when you look back, uh, you hope that uh, some of the things you were privileged to do, the great honor of being elected to represent the people of the 17th District of Texas and to have their vote for 26 years in the Congress and realize, and th did I please all of them? No, I mean, I, I, when I had opponents, I, I didn't have an opponent after I was first elected for three terms. So I always give young people who are interested in politics, and I'm hoping more of you are, uh, if you got a choice when you run for office of running opposed or unopposed, take unopposed, because that is a whole lot easier. But uh, that's not to be. I had a competitive district, and so it was 52, 54 percent. That was it. But fine, we still got along, and and that. So I hope when uh, somebody hears what I've just said that. It will encourage a young person to be that kind of representative. To I've read a lot more history uh, in the last four or five years teaching than I ever did in school or in Congress or what have you, because it's constant challenge with young people to make sure that as I tell them, you know, I'm going to give you a lot of opinion. You may have a different opinion than I do. I want you to share it. I'll never grade you down because you have a different opinion than I do because you may be right. And then watch their little eyes when they say, we know nothing, and a professor, we know more than him. Yeah, politics is not two and two equal four. 
Sometimes two and two is four and a half. Sometimes it's three and a half. You've got to go for that elusive vote. And I hope uh, that uh, somebody takes a good hard look at my record, whatever it was, and see if there was something in there that would inspire a young person to kind of follow that same and to be blessed by getting voted into office 13 times by the people that you're trying to represent. Uh, the other thing that I do with my classes, when they sit down, first, first thing out of my mouth, I said, stand up, raise your right hand, repeat after me. And I give them the oath of office to the United States Congress. I said, from now on, you're not only giving your answer in this class, but you're representing 800,000 other people. Keep that in mind. Now, you got my vote. I got you elected this time. If you're going to get reelected, you've got to do it on your own. And so the sharing with young people is something that uh, I've really enjoyed, and I appreciate Tarleton and the Texas A&M system for allowing me to do that. And uh, I hope that uh, it's rubbed off on a few folks.